Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> We're thankful that you all are here this morning to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we're also thankful for those that's tuned in, that's listening to us via the internet. We pray that God will bless you. Have you ever wondered uh, just what am I thankful for? You know, our country had a birthday yesterday and uh, a lot of celebrating going on last night. We're thankful for the men and women that gives us those kind of freedoms, put their lives on the line each and every day. But we're also thankful for men that do the work here behind the scenes. We're thankful for Barry Blevins and his work in the yards. I noticed he put some shrubberies out, and it looks very nice, so we're thankful for him. We're thankful for Henry and Kathy and Mike and Sid. We're thankful for Frank and Russ and Clay who help out with the food pantry and the collection of foods and to get them together and pass them out to those that needs it. You know, oftentimes we think uh, we're e insignificant sometimes about what we do, but what the least little thing can pick your neighbor up, the person sitting next to you. Just by being here each week, your faithfulness lifts the person up and helps them to know and believe realize what you believe in and it helps them as a result of that. We're thankful for Wilbert who films us each and every week. We're thankful for Russ who come down early in the morning, five o'clock I think it was, and they got the cables that we can have better audio. So it's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that we don't realize and we're thankful for all that. We also want to wish happy anniversary that also uh, Buddy and Nancy Maddox had one Friday, July the 3rd. We want to thank them, uh, uh, hope that they had a happy anniversary. And Tina Seavers had one Friday, July the 3rd. I know she's still celebrating. This week we have Jackson Blevins, Monday, July the 6th, and Billy Watson, uh, has one Thursday, July the 9th. So happy birthday to all y'all. Um, we have visitors. I don't know how much attention that Clay and Jessica is getting, but I bet the, the little one's getting a lot. Uh, his mom and dad and uh, his family is up here today, and uh, we wish them a safe trip as they return back. Uh, remember in prayers today, uh, Nelson Davis, Pat Hawkins, Cecil Ritchie, thank, thank you all for all the prayers uh, for, for this cancer that I'm fighting, and, uh, and thank you for praying for Nelda and all the family. They, they all need it, and, uh, and I appreciate you so much. You don't realize how much. Nikki Norris, and remember Frank Anderson, who is going to be traveling today after services. Remember our country, our leaders. We pray for we pray that they'll lead us in a way that we can preserve our, our freedoms. And I've got an announcement to make about Rosa King. As you know, she's having knee surgery. And she needs a volunteer for this month, month of July, to clean the church upstairs. I think Henry said he'd get the downstairs. We need someone to, uh, to clean it upstairs. So we need a volunteer. So you ask that you see one of the elders or... See Clay in regards to that. Just a reminder, fill out the cards that's directly in front of you uh, and list your prayer request on those cards so we'll know who to, uh, what to pray for. Review, when exiting, wear your mask. Put your mask on. You'll find uh, uh, you will exit from the back. Ones uh, on this side, you'll be on your left. Go out that door. One's Right here on your right, go out the uh, side door there. Uh, you will also see the offering plates. Don't be like I did last week and forgot to put my contribution in. So I uh, ask that you uh, put that in as you leave. Uh, those serving today is uh, Russ Rogers will be leading us in songs. The reading and prayer will be done by Roger Leonard. Thank you for that. Uh, 
the Lord's Supper will be headed up by Billy McWhorter, and also Adam will be helping out with that. Closing prayer will be done by myself, Cecil Ritchie, and security today has been handled by Frank Anderson. So join in, raise your voices in song to, is there anything I need that I may have, might have overlooked? If not, just praise God. Revive Us Again will be our first first song together. <laughs> We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, find the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We're marching to Zion. <laughs> Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus around the throne, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. To God be the glory. <laughs> To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so lofty the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Just a closer walk with thee. <laughs> I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, dear Lord, close to thee. Just 
a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When we all get to heaven, will be our life song before our reading and prayer. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the cause of life repay when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. We'll pray together and then we'll read the scripture. Let us pray. Dear God and Father in heaven, the creator of all and the one whom we serve through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this privilege this morning to assemble as your people to sing, to pray, and study together, to commune in a few moments through the medium of the Lord's Supper and spend tonight some time together as your people talking about things in our lives. We pray, Father, for the leaders of this country. We know, Father, there are many, many people who are confused. And we pray, Father, for those who are wanting to do what's right, whether they be the president or they be governors or po any other politicians or any other people. They will turn to your word to find the answers to this life's questions. We pray for the church that meets here for her shepherds, her deacons, and her preacher, and all the members. We thank you for what they're doing in this city, in this community. We thank you for the privilege we have to wear the name Christian. We pray, Father, for those who are your children who are sick. There have been names mentioned here who are some who are seriously ill, and we pray that your hand of healing would be upon them. 
providentially they can receive what they need and be comforted. We pray for your people all over the world. We pray for the other elders and churches who are seeking to meet in a safe manner and yet seek to worship. We pray that they'll be given wisdom. We pray for those who are not faithful to our Lord, that something might be done or said to cause them to consider their souls and their eternity. Give us wisdom as we reach out and speak, not only to these, but others who do not know Christ. We pray that you would be with us throughout the remainder of this worship. Our minds will be fixed on you, and we'll go away from here more challenged to be pleasing in your sight. We thank you for Christ and his blood that paid the price for our sins. May we walk in the light and keep ourselves clean. We pray that you'd forgive us as we confess and we repent. And we ask this in Christ's precious name. And amen. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning again. So good to be here with all of you this first day of the week in person. Those who are gathered, you know, I usually gesture to the computer, but we finally got that out of the pulpit. Those who are gathered with us online and those who are watching the recording, we're grateful for another Lord's Day an opportunity to worship our good God, for He alone deserves our worship. I'm especially grateful to have my family with me today, my mom and dad and my older sister and her two children. Uh, only my brother and, and younger sister are missing from our crew and my brother-in-law. Uh, he cho they chose not to be here, so uh, we're so grateful for another first day of the week. When I was in the seventh grade, we were learning... SAT words every week using something that was called visualized vocabulary. And so we would take each week a new SAT word, and with that word we would make a word or picture or story so that we could remember the meaning of the word when it came up on the SAT test. Now, for example, we learned the word innocuous, which means innocent. And we painted a picture, we drew a picture of an inn, and an octopus lived in the inn, and he was not harmful. He was a friendly octopus. And so he was an innocuous inn octopus. And that was our visualized vocabulary. Now I want you to hold that thought for just a moment. As we continue to think about what it means to belong to Christ and His body, the church, we're going to consider the biblical concept of fellowship. Now, I don't know about what comes to your mind when you hear the word fellowship, but if I'm honest, most of the time when I hear the word fellowship, I think about one thing. Food. Fellowship, what's the word we all, meal, <laughs> potlucks. But fellowship, according to the New Testament pattern, is much more than just that. 
The word that is translated fellowship, koinonia, you may have heard that before, is found 19 times in the Greek New Testament. And the verb form of that word appears eight times. And of those 27 appearances, none of them refer specifically to your everyday meal. And so what does fellowship really mean? Now let's return to our visualized vocabulary. I, this may be a little bit silly, but I'm going to offer you a visual picture for the word fellowship. So let's think about fellows on a ship. What do we know about fellows on a ship? Well, if they're all on the same ship, then they're all going to the same place. And they all have the same leader. And they all have a task to do, it may not be the same task, that relates to their shared goal of arriving at their destination safely. And they all share the resources on that ship, whether it's in common meals or it's in the space, the confined space of the ship. And whether they recognize it or not, because of all of these things, their lives are bound together. And in many cases, their livelihood as well. Believe it or not, that's pretty close to the biblical definition of fellowship. My dad read for us this morning from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. This is the second time in Luke's historical record of the first Christians that he summarizes the church. The first summary is found at the end of Acts chapter 2. And one commentator has said about these verses that we just read that Luke is presenting a description of what Christianity was once like and ought to be again. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take specifically Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, and I'm borrowing, uh, I'm making no a pretension about this, I'm borrowing from Jimmy Jividen in his book on fellowship called Koinonia, A Place for Tough and Tender Love. Three things we can see in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 about fellowship. And so we're going to look at that verse and some related verses as we define fellowship together this morning. Once again, Luke says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. I want you to notice, first of all, the full number of all those who believed. They were all believers. They shared a common faith. Luke does not describe them as Christians in this passage. In fact, Luke is, has set out to write a historical record of the church. Now, he's not doing that purely for history's sake. He's got religious convictions in mind as well. But it's only in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 that we first find the word Christian, where Luke says the, Christian, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. But here he uses the word Believers. He says all those who believed were of one heart and one spirit or mind. Fundamentally, what sets Christians apart from the rest of the world is what we believe. Fundamentally, what sets us apart from the rest of the world is what we believe. The gospel is an invitation that God made in Jesus Christ, and it is an invitation that is built upon firm, factual truths. And the response to the gospel, the obedience of the gospel, is not merely the, ex the acceptance of these truths, but the acceptance of these truths such that we change who we are, and how we live because of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, there are many people in the world who for one reason or another have not accepted the truth of the gospel. They do not believe. And so they do not allow God's claim in Jesus Christ to affect their lives. But those who belong to God in Jesus Christ, who have accepted God's claim, who believe we are in fellowship. 
We are in fellowship, a common sharing of our common faith with Jesus Christ and with all those who as well have accepted this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, as he opens his letter, God is faithful by whom you were call, brought into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Fellowship, sharing, partnership, commonality of what we believe. It means that we belong to Christ and to one another in Christ and we work alongside Christ and one another for the gospel. Our outlook on life changes because we have a new master and a new hope. As I was preparing for this lesson, I was thinking about this, com this idea of common faith, common belief, or, or we might even say common experience. And I was looking for stories of a shared experience. And it was only fitting with yesterday being July the 4th uh, when I found a first-hand account from a military veteran. He was telling the story about how he had been on a business trip with one of his co-workers and they had taken a, a, a cab, an Uber actually, he said. And so while they were in this Uber, he struck up a conversation with the driver. And within a few moments, he found out that they were both military veterans, United States military veterans. And that completely changed the conversation that they had because they had a shared experience. They had seen and experienced things that most people have not. And when they got out of the cab, they had arrived at their destination, the two co-workers were talking and the fellow co-worker said, I was just amazed at the way the conversation changed. When you both realized that you were veterans of the United States military, she said, I learned more about you in that seven minute in that in that short conversation than I learned than I've learned about you in seven years of being your coworker. The fact that we have a common faith, and because of that faith, a common experience of being transformed by God in his gospel through Jesus Christ, having heard and believed in Jesus Christ, turned from our life of sin, confessed his name, and been baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, sets us apart from the world, but it brings us together. Because we now share something that most people do not. A common experience and understanding. Not only of who we are and what we've done, but what God has done in Christ for us. And so, as we think about this, we ought to remember that our common faith ought to bring us together and bind us. We sing that song, Bind Us Together, Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is beginning the practical half of his letter to the church in Ephesus. And the very first thing that he emphasizes to this church is unity. He says in Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, that is, to the gospel, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now I want to notice something. This is a side note. I'm not going to chase this rabbit too far. But what you get in verses 1 and 3 are the attitudes of unity, and then in verses 4 through 6, the doctrines of unity. That'll preach, preacher. I'm looking at you. The attitudes of unity in verses 1 through 3 and the doctrines of unity in verses 4 through 6. But you see what he says. Humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another in love so that we can maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And then he comes down in verses 4 through 6 and he says, here are the key doctrines. Here are the things that we have to share in common. If we don't share these in common, we will not be united. But the, the, the other is true as well. When we share a belief in the one body, the one spirit, the one hope, we will be united because the rest of the world doesn't have these things. And so first of all, as we look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, and we find the inspired writer Luke defining fellowship in the early church, we see him observing that they were all believers. They had a common faith. Then we see, as we continue in the verse, that they were all united. He says they were of one, one heart and soul. One heart and soul. Uh, it's been said that Luke is actually using the language of friendship that was common in his day. Some 300 or so years before Luke was writing this, 
the Greek philosopher Aristotle defined friendship as one soul in two bodies. Now the phrase that one soul is the same phrase in Greek that Luke uses here in verse 32. In the Greek Old Testament, in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 38, as the writer there is describing the children of Israel's acceptance of David as the king, he says they had one soul. They were united in the purpose of making David their king. So when Luke says they had one heart and soul, he's saying they're united emotionally, but they're also united in their attitude, in their purpose, and what it is that they sought to do. Luke seems to suggest on the basis of his language and their common faith that they had a unity of purpose that touched almost every aspect of their lives. Now, this is not uncommon when we look at fellowship in the broader context in the New Testament. In Philemon 17, there's only, there's only one chapter in Philemon, so I don't have to put a chapter there. In Philemon 17, Paul is appealing to Philemon, who is a slave owner, and he says, I met your slave who ran away, Onesimus. He was converted to Christ. And I'm sending him back to you. And I want you to receive him, not as a slave, but as a brother, just as you would receive me. And so he says in verse 17, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. The word partner there is from the same Greek word that is defined fellowship, koinonia. It's from that same word. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 10, when Luke is describing Peter, James, and John as business partners in a fishing venture, he uses the same word related to fellowship. Partner or partnership. It means that the individuals involved share both in the resources but also in the purpose or the goal. And specifically in the New Testament, this is a sharing of our purpose or goal to glorify God in Christ. You may recall in our series on Belong, a sermon from May, that's, that's going back a while now, called Under Construction from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4-12, through 12, where we talked about the fact that as Christians, we are the living stones in the temple of God to glorify God in Jesus Christ. This is our united purpose. It is an aspect of the fellowship that we share through God in Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul refers to the Philippians' partnership with him in the gospel. That probably means, or at least includes, the fact that they supported him financially in his work, but it goes beyond that as well. It involves a unity of purpose, the furtherance of the gospel. A unity of purpose. When I think about unity of purpose, I can't help but think about a rowing team. Usually, uh, we would be watching the Olympics about now, pretty soon. And one sport that is fascinating is Olympic team rowing. And if you've ever looked into that at all, it is an extremely physical sport. I was reading about it, and it said that, uh, you know, there's a threshold that people reach in any physical activity where it is only mental toughness that allows them to continue. Their body, their muscles tell them they're spent. But the mind says, no, I'm going to keep going. In team rowing, it's in the first, like, 10 seconds that they reach that. I mean, it's incredible, and it takes a lot longer than that to complete the course. I was reading one description of the activity of team rowing. A rower who tries to stand out or do something differently will only hamper the speed of the boat. Every segment of the stroke must be matched in time with exacting unity. The individuals who sacrifice their personal desires and ambitions for the sake of the crew will win races as a team. They have to be in perfect sync. They have to have the same goal and work together. Our common purpose as Christians, the fellowship we share through Jesus Christ, is to live out the gospel in every aspect of our lives. This is what Paul says 
to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind. That sounds a lot like what Luke said in Acts 4.32, doesn't it? Standing firm with, in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That's fellowship. Because of the common faith we share, we have a united purpose to glorify God by spreading His gospel. That's not just in word, but it's also in what we do. And so I'm going to challenge myself and hopefully you as well by asking these questions. Is my life a testimony of the gospel? Is my life a testimony of the gospel in the way that I live as a husband and a father and a son and an uncle? Is my life a testimony of the gospel in the way that I do my job? Is my life a, a testimony of the gospel in the way that I interact with my neighbors? In the small interactions that I have in the grocery store or the shopping mall? Is my life a testimony of the gospel and do I look for and encourage this same kind of testimony in my fellow Christians? That is an aspect of biblical fellowship. Luke says they were united in purpose. They had a common purpose. They were united in their faith. They had a common belief that changed who they were. And finally we see, this is the one that makes us uncomfortable. They were all unselfish. They had a common property. They had common property. Luke says at the end there of verse 32, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now, we just, many of us, maybe all of us celebrated yesterday the birth of this country I've got a copy of the Declaration of Independence that hangs on my wall in my office, July 4th, 1776. One of the key rights that is enshrined, if you will, in the founding documents of this country is the right to private property. The Fifth Amendment, part of the Bill of Rights that was ratified almost as soon as the Constitution was established in this country, says that every American has the right, I'm paraphrasing, to hold private property. But when we read this verse, Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, it sounds an awful lot like what we would call communism, right? Nobody had, it would, that's, is that really what the verse is saying? Well, there are, there are at least a couple of key differences between what Luke is describing in Acts 4.32 and what we know as communism. First, and perhaps most important, is the fact that this was an act of free will. Nobody was required to give up their property. In fact, as we read throughout the rest of that passage, what we found was that Barnabas, Joseph called Barnabas, made a decision of his own accord, of his own choice, to sell his property and set the proceeds at the apostles' feet. When we go into chapter 5, we see another couple who makes a decision to sell their property and they lied to the apostles and it's not the fact that they didn't give everything but it's the fact that they lied about it that is a punishable offense. And so this is not something that is required of anyone in the church. It is an act of free will but even perhaps more important than that it is an act that reflects a selfless attitude of the Christians. It was selflessness that created a reality, Acts 4, verse 34, that there was no one who was needy among them. There was no one who was needy among them. Not because they were required to give up anything, but because they chose, because of their understanding of the gospel, to give up those things. Fellowship involves sharing both in the physical and the spiritual. Now that's what Paul describes 
in Romans chapter 15, beginning at verse 25. He's talking there about the collection for the poor in Jerusalem. He says in verse 24 that he was hoping to go to Rome. But he says, at present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia, these are Gentile regions, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, which primarily would have been Jews, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, those of the Jews, remember the gospel is to the Jews first, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. Fellowship is something that is shared spiritually and physically. It involves giving and taking of ourselves physically and spiritually. In fact, the word used for collection in the New Testament is often translated from that same word family, koinonia. Matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13, when Paul speaks of the collection, he's using that word. The church is not just a body. The church is a family. And families make sure that everyone is fed and clothed and covered against the elements. We don't worry about whether or not that roof belongs to me or you. We worry about making sure everyone in the family is under it. Fellowship is about sharing a common faith, a common purpose, and yes, in a, in, a, in a sense, common property. I'm reminded of a story that's told about a man who was about to be baptized. And he had his handkerchief in his pocket and he didn't want to get it wet. So he, he pulled it out of his pocket and handed it to his friend who was nearby. And in the act of doing that, his wallet fell out. And the friend said, well, I'll hold your wallet for you too so that it, it doesn't get wet. And the man said, no, I want to take it with me. And I'm going to read what he said. Now, when I go down into the water, I want my wallet to be baptized with me for that as well as myself must be devoted to the service of the Lord. Ooh, this is uncomfortable, isn't it? Now I'm talking about our pocketbook. Now I'm talking about our money. I try not to be one of those preachers who talks about money. And we've done really well, by the way, in spite of not meeting in person for many weeks with our contribution. But as Christians, we should view our property as a tool, a tool for glorifying God, both in the body and in the world. Matter of fact, that's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. Y'all, I'm not used to having three babies in church. Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, I'm reminded of Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. Sometimes uh, I will pass by someone who is in uh, Walmart's parking lot asking for donations to this charity or that charity, and, and I think that with due diligence, it's fine to donate to those organizations. But I'm reminded of what happened in Acts chapter 4. The individual sold their property and they laid it at the apostles' feet. There's nothing shameful about making your contribution, your giving, primarily about supporting the Lord's work in His church. That's the model we have in the New Testament. And we have a model even from that verse of saying, it's not just that we have to freely give to one another, but we put it under the oversight of the leaders that God has assigned. Now, with that being said, we still have a responsibility to one another 
as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And if we see a brother or sister in need, or even someone in the world who's in need, we don't have to go through the treasury to meet that need. And in fact, if our only thought is, well, I'll put some more money in the plate, we may need to work a little bit on our compassion and our intimacy with our fellow brother because we are in fellowship. But it can't be compelled It has to be something that we do because we understand the self-sacrificial attitude that God had for us when He offered His Son in Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sins. What is fellowship? Well, just think about fellows on a ship. They're all going to the same place. They all have the same captain. They all have a job to do that serves the overall purpose that they share of arriving at their destination safely. They all share the resources on board the ship. And therefore, because of all of these things they share, they share their very lives. Luke describes Christian fellowship in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. All had a common faith. They were all believers. All had a common purpose. They were united. They had a common property because they were all unselfish. Now that's fellowship. Perhaps you're looking for that. You see, our sin separates us from God, but because of what God has done in Jesus Christ, we can be reunited with Him, be in fellowship with God in Jesus Christ through obedience to the Gospel. If you're ready to obey that Gospel this morning, or if you're a child of God who needs to return, Or if you simply need prayers and encouragement from those who are gathered here today, we'll be happy to do anything we can for you. We're going to sing an invitation song. We're not going to stand up. But if you indicate in some way that you need assistance, we will provide it after we sing this invitation song.
please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Lord that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come together this morning. We invite of our Lord and Savior to die a cruel cross on us, a cruel death on the cross for our sins. We ask you to be with each and every one of us this morning and partake of this and to do it in a manner we will please you in your eyes. This we ask your Son's name. Amen. Bow with me again. Gracious Heavenly Father, come to you again at this time as we gather around this table, asking that your blessings be upon this fruit of the vine, which to the Christian represents the blood that was shed for us on that cross. And we ask as we all partake of it, that we might do so in a manner that's well-pleasing unto you. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Just a reminder to remind you that the offering plates are in the outside one on the right and one on the left. We'll exit from the back to the front. And I hope you all have a really good weekend. Thank you, Clay, for a good message. And bow and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thankful, Father, for this day and realize the many blessings that you give us each day. We're thankful for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We're thankful, Father, that uh, if we found to be truthful and obedient to you, committed and submissive, that we have a home in heaven waiting for us. We ask you, Lord, to continue to be with us through the remainder of this week. We ask you, Lord, that you will give you the proper time to build us and to make us into a stronger Christian. Help us, the Lord, to always reach out in fellowship and love to one another. Help us to be available to our fellow man and for our, to our members of our congregation. Help us, Lord, to give all we got to you in body, mind, and spirit. We're thankful, Father, for the country in which we live and realize we're in the midst of lots of turmoil. We pray, God, that you'll help us to and help the leaders to turn to you and make the decisions that best promotes peace and reserves our freedoms. We pray, Father, we'll conduct ourselves in a way that everything we say and that we do would bring you honor and bring you glory. We pray for those that's going to be traveling today. We pray, Father, for their safety. We pray, Father, that you would be with Frank as he is going to be gone. Pray that you bring him back to his family safely as well. We're thankful for the visitors today. We're thankful for those that are listening to us over the Internet. Help us, Lord, to always give you the proper time in order to make us grow we pray father that you will forgive us of our sins and help us lord to always be available to everyone who is in need we ask this in jesus precious name amen